In this video, we're going over the worst cards that have an effect to allow you to attack your opponent directly. An effect in Yu-Gi-Oh, which allows you to damage your opponent's life points even if your opponent controls monsters on their side of the field. And at number 10, we have Amphibious Bugroth MK3. This is a level 4 monster with 1500 attack and simply has the effect that if the field spell card Umi is face up on the field, this card can attack your opponent's life points directly. Now at 1500 attack, that's actually not half bad for monsters that can attack directly even if it does have the condition where you need to have a field spell card in order for it to work. Although funny enough, if you actually have the original Umi field spell card out, this card will lose 200 attack because it's a machine type monster. Luckily, Umi is like one of those cards that has the most amount of other cards that can treat their name exactly as Umi. So if you just have something like a legendary ocean out, then it will gain 200 attack and be a lot better. Now, the only real problem with this card is it doesn't really have any synergy with the deck that likes to run Umi, and has never seen any competitive play over the years because it's pretty squarely mediocre. It's not that bad, but it's funny that when this card originally came out, it actually got a damage decrease if you used it in its intended way. So it's just a good one to start off this list at number 10. And at number 9, we have Elemental Hero Rampart Blaster. This is a level 6 fusion monster which requires two named normal monster elemental hero cards as its materials and has the effect that while it's in defense position it can attack your opponent directly, but its attack is halved during damage calculation. So with its baseline attack at 2000 it will only deal 1000 points of damage if it tries to attack directly in defense position. And with 2500 defense, that's not half bad. You can poke for around 1000 points of damage every turn while having a 2500 attack wall that your opponent has to get over in order to stop those direct attacks. The problem with this card is it's kind of the same as the previous spot, and that it's really mediocre, that's just not really a good strategy either. Plus, you have to play two normal monsters in order to bring this card out, or at least one of them, and a fusion substitute, and its effect is not really worth the effort to fusion summon this card. It also can't be cheated out. So, why is a plainly mediocre card on this list? Well, usually for worst of videos, there aren't exactly super bad cards to talk about, and just kind of below average or mediocre ones. But also, because this card is actually a little bit worse than I described. You see, its effect in the official TCG Yu-Gi-Oh! database states that this card can only attack while in face of defense position if your opponent controls no monsters. And then if it does attack, then its attack is halved during damage calculation. You see, in the OCG, there's an official ruling where this card can attack directly, but according to this card's second errata in the TCG, it actually has the effect where it can only attack directly if your opponent controls no monsters. And since this card is incredibly mediocre either way, I don't think it really matters. So it's just at number 9 because in the OCG, it's just mediocre, and in the TCG, it's kind of bad but I'm not sure if we're even using the TCG rulings or if they just forgot to update it. So, I'm just playing it safe by putting this card at the number 9 spot, rather than somewhere near the top just in case it is actually working like the OCG is supposed to. And at number 8, we have Overpowering Eye. This is a spell card which allows you to target one zombie monster you control with 2000 or less attack, and that monster can attack directly this turn. Now, this card is fine on surface level. You can just use it on a zombie monster with less than 2000 attack, and then retroactively give it a boost because it still keeps the effect to attack directly for this turn. So if you use it on something like Zombie Master and then equip it with Psychic Blade and give it 2000 extra attack, that's 3800 points of direct damage right there. The problem being is you have to set up a whole bunch of extra work just to get off that one little attack, and generally it's not worth it. The ability to attack directly is not that big of a deal in the TCG, especially not on monsters who have a baseline of less than 2000 attack and can't bring themselves out of the extra deck. And especially not on zombies who aren't really known for having high attack point value potential, like with machine type monsters and their specific support limiter removal. Zombie is a pretty safe type for a card like this to exist with, and it's perfectly mediocre enough where it's never seen competitive play because having to use one card in your hand to give one monster a direct attack for one turn is honestly not worth the card in your hand. However, I remember a lot of the old Yu-Gi-Oh games, since this card is kinda mediocre, they would include it a lot in any deck that has zombie cards in it, so that you wouldn't have too hard of a time against that NPC. Although in Duel Links, with the starting life point value of 4000, being able to attack directly is a little bit more of a big deal over there. But even then, I don't think they would probably use Overpowering Eye if it was introduced. And at number 7, we have Alien Infiltrator. 
This is a card which can attack directly if there's no other cards in the same column as this card. And with a baseline attack of 800, that's not really a big deal. It also has another effect where once per turn you can move this card over to an adjacent monster zone that's unoccupied. So that maybe can get off its effect to attack directly. When this card first came out, players didn't really keep track of cards in columns and zones. That wasn't really a widespread thing people kept track of until Link Monsters are introduced. So this card was kind of useless in the early days when cards were just kind of laid out wherever, and no one really cared what monster zones your cards were in. I mean, if you use cards like Alien Infiltrator, then both players would have to start following the rules, but it wasn't good enough for that to really matter. It also has nothing to do with the alien archetypes besides having an alien in its name and the same aesthetics with its artwork, so it was never really played in alien decks who really like cards that can do something with A counters. They just really missed the mark with this card. It's not a good direct attacker, and it's not even good in its own archetype, and it had a column-based mechanic back when no one paid attention to them. Although at the very least, if you normal summon this card, you can probably attack directly with it at least once, with very little resistance. And at number 6, we have Battle Teleportation. This is a trap card which can only be activated if you control a single face-up psychic type monster, in which case that monster can attack your opponent directly this turn. But at the end of the battle phase, you have to give control of that monster to your opponent. Now, psychic type monsters are at least a little bit better at granting themselves extra attack through their effects and cards than zombie monsters are, but they're still not really a powerhouse when it comes to big numbers. So granting them the ability to attack directly isn't that big of a deal. Especially since you have to set this card first, and then wait a whole turn before you can even use it, then it has a conditional effect where you can only control that one face-up card, and after it does attack, you have to give that monster to your opponent. So you just kinda go minus three in that whole exchange. You lose one card for using battle teleportation itself, you lose another card for giving your monster to your opponent, and then your opponent gains a monster, hence the minus three. However, if you win that direct attack, that doesn't really matter. I'm not sure that was the intended use of the card, and that's why they kinda made it a little bit restrictive. It's still not good, kinda bad even, which is why it's an excellent card for this list. And at number 5, we have Infernity Archer. This is a level 6 monster with 2000 attack, which has the effect that if you have no cards in your hand, this card can attack your opponent directly. This card doesn't have any way to bring itself out from the hand easier, so you'd have to expend resources in order to get this card in the field. And it doesn't really mesh with its archetype very well, other than just having the same restrictions as a lot of the Infernity cards. Infernity specialize in gaining insane advantage when you have no cards in your hand, due to cards like Infernity Archifine or Infernity Launcher, and locking down your opponent with cards like Infernity Barrier or Infernity Break. Infernities are a very good control deck that's able to generate a lot of advantage, and those kinds of decks don't need low attack level 6 monsters whose only effect is to attack directly. So outside of the Infernity archetype, Infernity Archer is also not very useful because you have to have no cards in your hand in order to gain its good effect. And it's still not really worth bringing out a card that requires a tribute summon and has mediocre attack for a level 6 monster. Basically, anything less than 2400 attack on a 1 tribute monster is kinda bad. So, it's kind of like Alien Infiltrator. It's bad in its own archetype and not really useful outside of it. But, it's even less useful than Alien Infiltrator. And at number 4, we have Mucus Yolk. This is a level 3 monster who can attack your opponent's life points directly, and each time it inflicts battle damage to your opponent, you get to increase the attack of this card by 1000 during your next standby phase and it gains this attack increase permanently. So as long as you're able to keep making attacks with Mucus Yolk, it will keep gaining a thousand attack every turn. So what's bad about this card? Well, it has zero attack, which means this card literally cannot activate its own effect under its own power. Sure, it can attack directly even with zero attack, but since it can't deal any battle damage, you can't use its effect to increase its attack during your next standby phase. You would have to use some other card to give this card some attack points so they could attack directly, which could probably most easily be solved if it fit into some kind of field spell card, but the card itself kind of has an awkward type and attribute combination, being Dark Aqua. You could still just give this an equip spell card or just some other kind of attack increaser, like Banner of Courage, and it would start gaining its attack, but funny enough, there are actually two other cards in the game with the exact same effect, and just better. There's Drill Barnacle and Raging Flame Sprite. Both of them have the effect that allow them to attack directly, and both have the effect that when they inflict battle damage to your opponent by a direct attack, 
they gain 1,000 attack points permanently. And they both actually have more than zero attack. Granted, they also both have very low attack, but it's still better than having zero. And the other problem with Muka's Yelk is the fact that it doesn't actually gain the attack boost until your next standby phase. So it stays a super low attack vulnerable monster for a lot longer than its other two counterparts, who gain their attack boost immediately after doing damage. And its two better counterparts aren't even that good of cards either, but they at least don't need support in order to start using their effect. And at number 3 we have Plasma Ball. This is a level 3 Thunder monster who has the effect where it can attack your opponent directly. But when this card inflicts battle damage to your opponent by a direct attack, it destroys itself. Now I'm not really sure what the point of this card is. Usually I can kind of see some benefit to cards even if they're kind of mediocre or bad, but this one just seems to have a very unnecessary restriction on its pretty mediocre effect. It only has 900 attack, which isn't good for a direct attacker. Pretty much all the Watt monsters have more attack and gain effects after attacking directly. Like Watt Cobra who can go plus one if it attacks directly, and even has 100 more attack, you know, and also has the ability to attack directly. Also, the fact that it's a Thunder Light type doesn't seem to be that big of a deal either, because again, the Watt monsters also share the same type and attribute, and are just better. It almost seemed like this card was probably made bad on purpose, because it's not like this card came out in the early days of the game either. It literally came out in the exact same set that had the Watt monsters. In fact, the same set that had Watt Cobra even. So unless there's some kind of super good synergy I don't know about, I'm pretty sure this card was meant to be a joke. But at least it's easy to use. And at number 2 we have Hero Flash with 2 exclamation points. This is a normal spell card which can only be activated by banishing 4 specific spell cards from your graveyard. Then it gives you the ability to special summon an Elemental Hero Normal Monster from your deck, and grants you the effect where all of your Elemental Hero Normal Monsters can attack your opponent directly this turn. The best target for this card is Elemental Hero Neos, and of the Hero Flash cards you need to banish, at least one of them is good. E Emergency Call is played in pretty much all hero decks, and R Righteous Justice is a neat alternative to Spell or Trap card removal, but the other two cards required are pretty meh. And Hero Flash itself is basically a dead card until you can activate its tough activation requirements. And that's basically the whole crux of this card. It's too hard to use and not worth the payoff. Like, compare this card to something like Law of the Normal, which requires you to have 5 level 2 or lower monsters on your side of the field. And if you have this activation requirement set, you get to destroy all of the cards in the field in both players' hands. That's in effect worth its tough activation requirement not only allowing Elemental Hero normal monsters to attack directly this turn, and only be able to special summon one Elemental Hero normal monster from your deck. It's just too much work for such a pretty mediocre payoff that probably won't even win you the game, as getting four specific cards in the graveyard is actually a lot harder than you'd think. The number one spot on this list kind of falls in the same category as this one. It's just not really worth the amount of effort that's put into actually using it. And at number one, we have Checkmate. Probably one of the most disappointing uses of such an iconic chess move, as what this card does is it allows you to tribute one Archfiend monster on your side of the field, then during this turn, a single Terror King Archfiend monster you control can attack your opponent's life points directly. Terror King Archfiend is a level 4 monster with 2000 attack, which cannot be normal summoned unless you have an Archfiend monster already on your side of the field, and also has a maintenance cost where you have to pay 800 life points to each of your standby phases to keep this card on the field. And why does this card have a maintenance cost? Well, because of its excellent effect, of course, where if this card is targeted by the effect of a card controlled by your opponent, you can roll a six-sided dice. And if the result is two or five, you can then negate the opponent's effect and destroy that card. So you have a one-third chance of targeted effects to be canceled out on this card. And also it negates the effects of monsters it destroys by battle. That is to say, this is definitely the boss monster of the original Archfiend archetype, and it's also a huge contributing factor to why Archfiends were kind of a joke on Inception. Modern Archfiend decks don't play any of the original Archfiend cards because they're all kind of bad. And Checkmate is supposed to be the signature card that allows this one card to attack directly at the cost of tributing another one of your Archfiend monsters. Checkmate is just a worse version of Overpowering Eye, because Overpowering Eye could be used on zombie monsters with 2000 attack, and didn't require a specific named zombie, nor a tribute cost in order to activate the card. Generally, if a card requires a specific named monster, it needs to be really good to kind of justify a spot in the deck. 
kind of like the entire Eldritch archetype. So checkmate is already restrictive enough by only being usable on one monster, who actually himself has conditions for how it can even be brought out from your hand. But adding a tribute cost on top of that just makes the card laughably bad, which is why I think it's probably a little bit worse than Hero Flash with two exclamation points, which is also really hard to activate, but at least that card allows you to special summon a 2500 tank beat stick from your deck and at least Plasma Ball can attack directly without jumping through hoops. All right, and that's the list. If you have any other wonderful ideas for worst of list, I'd love to hear about them down in the comments, because fun fact, the average worst of top 10 performs better than a best of top 10 video by a magnitude of about three times. Yet 99% of suggestions are about best of top 10s. So it seems people really love to watch these kinds of videos, even if they don't like to make suggestions for them. Also, subscribe so I can hit 200k.